movement at all because none of the members of this series of movers have the ability to move independent of the first mover. So, what Thomas is talking about is the difference between a series of causes ordered um, per accident, don't get freaked by the language, and an order, a series of, um, a series of causes ordered per se. So what's the difference between these two? Consider a painter. A painter paints a painting. After the painter has finished painting the painting, what relationship is there between the painter and the painting in terms of continued existence? No relationship whatsoever. The painting continues to exist independent of the painter. If the painter should pass away, Leonardo da Vinci doesn't live anymore. Okay? But the Mona Lisa still exists, right? So the painting continues to exist independent of the painter. This is a series of causes ordered per accident. Okay? One after another after another. Like your domino example. All right? After the, do after the last domino falls, what happens? Nothing. After the, after the mover, the guy who put the dominoes together, after he pushes the first domino over, what part does he play in the rest of the equation? None whatsoever. The dominoes are on their own now, right? And the, move, the person who pushed them over has no relationship to their existence or their continued motion. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the paint, think of this uh, ordered per accident, okay, the painter. Now, a series of causes ordered per se, let's think of a violinist. The violinist is playing her song. What happens if the violinist passes away? What happens to the song? It goes on. How does the song go on if the one who's playing the song... Not other people pick it up. No, no, the actual song. The actual song that the violinist is playing. Not the music on the sheet. It stops. It stops. It absolutely stops because the relationship between the violinist and the song still holds. The, the, the song, the existence of the song is absolutely dependent on the continued existence of the violinist. If the violinist should cease to exist, the song would cease to exist. Yes? I don't see the difference between the painter and the violinist. How do you mean? The well, painter paint. Well, the painter paints. The painting is finished. And yes. No but it's still there. It's, it's still there. And the, the, and the music is gone. Oh, got it. See what I mean? Oh. Yeah. So do we? We don't have a painting in here, do we? <laughs> we have this icon. So whoever created this icon, you know, I'm not sure where they are. I have no idea if they're still in, in existence anymore. But the icon's still there, and the icon exists independently of the one who created it. But if I'm sitting here whistling in tune, and I croak in the middle of that tune, what happens to the tune? It ceases to exist. Okay? This is, a, this is an example of causes ordered per se. Okay, so the spoon, they're all moving, and that's the, that's the example 
of the hand stirring the spoon, stirring the broth, stirring the ingredients of the spoon, They're, of the stew. They're all moving and only moving because of the action of their relationship to the first mover, the hand. The spoon, broth, and ingredients have no power to cause themselves or anything else to move of themselves. Just like the violin, just like the song has no power to cause itself to exist of itself. It is totally dependent on the violinist to bring it into existence. They all move only because the hand moves. If the hand never moved the spoon in the first place, then the spoon would never have moved and neither would the stew. Also, if the hand should stop moving, so would the spoon, so would the broth, and so would the beef cubes, potatoes, carrots, etc. Thomas is not arguing that the first mover initiated movement at some particular moment in the distant past, like your domino example. That's not Thomas's argument. Thomas is arguing that the first mover is the cause of movement now, and at any moment for that series of movers. So if the hand doesn't move, the spoon doesn't move, the broth doesn't move, the potatoes, carrots, and beef cubes don't move. They're all dependent on the action of the hand, which is the first mover in this example. Okay? That's a series per accidents where all of those things moving, okay, only move in relation to the first mover. So here you have the hand stirring the stew. Hand stirring the stew. All right, here you have the example of the billiard balls or the dominoes. Let's use your um, Dorothy's example of dominoes. Okay? The first one moves the second one, moves the second one, moves the second one. See, here, here's, the, here's the first domino, the second one, the third one, and the fourth one, etc. The movement of the first domino is contingent on the movement of what? The third domino. And that's the only thing it needs to move, the third domino. The third domino is dependent on the movement of the second domino. And the second dependent on the movement of the first domino. Okay? Let's say that the person who started, who put the dominoes together, let's say that he sits, he puts his finger right here and knocks over the third domino. Will the fourth one fall? Yes, because it's not dependent on the second or the first domino's movement, only on the third domino's movement. In, a, in an order, in a series of causes, ordered per accidents, any particular mover is dependent only on the movement of the previous mover. Okay? But in this one, in persons, okay, you got your ingredients of the stew, you got your spoon, and you've got your hand, okay? That's miserable, I know that. <laughs> okay? Is the, is the, is the stew, is the, is, are the beef cubes dependent on the movement of the spoon, ultimately? No. Because the spoon is dependent on the, on the hand. If the hand isn't moving, neither are the beef cubes. Do you see the difference? Because in here, the first mover, everything depends on the movement of the first mover. That's why Thomas said that if there's no first mover, there's no movement at all. There's no movement at all. Okay? All right. 
If there's no violinist, there's no song. Over here, as soon as the painter is done, the painting continues to exist. You don't need the painter anymore. The painter still exists. Over here, if the violinist is no more, the song is no more. So, there must then be a first mover responsible for all movement from potentiality to actuality. A mover who isn't moved from potentiality to actuality by another. But that has the power to move from, but has the power to move others from potentiality to actuality. An unmoved mover. And in this sense, what he moves, means by unmoved mover um, not in, is, is not in the sense of being inactive, but in the sense of not needing to be moved by another. Okay? The hand does not need to be moved by the spoon or the broth or the beef cubes. The hand moves itself. Okay? Now that's an example. Obviously, in real life, the hand has to be attached to a person and you, go, you still can go back and back and back. But it can't go back forever. Because if it went back forever, okay, then you would have a first mover and there would be no mover at all, movement at all. If this went back forever, all right, then what you're saying, and some people say this, well, why can't it be the universe? Why can't the universe be the first mover? Because if, the, if there's no first mover, even in this equation, if there's first no mover, okay, mm -hmm. then you have basically a self-sustaining system. So if the universe was not created by another, then the universe is a self-sustaining system. Which is the same thing as saying what? The universe is the cause of its own existence. Which is absurd. Because if you don't possess existence, you can't give it to yourself. You can't exist. You can't bring yourself into existence. Okay? You can't bring yourself into existence. Even the universe can't bring itself into existence. It needs another outside of itself. Something that possesses existence in essence. And that's what God is. God, in a real sense, God does not exist. God is existence. God does not act. God is pure act. There is no potentiality in God. God does not potent, possess potentiality. He is pure act. Okay? There is nothing he lacks. He is pure act. Darth. Thomas could have taken care of this by just telling people, refer to the creation. God started all motion just with the creation of the universe and mm -hmm. the world and everything else. Well, that's what St. Paul says. And that's ultimately what Thomas does say. But he went around it. Does he, does he, did he ever write anything simple? <laughs> it's so deep and complicated. Well, but you have to remember who he's talking to. Psychologist, but he no, had a... He's, ta he's talking to students who are beginners in theology. All right? And these beginners in theology are going to be going out into a world that rejects the existence of God. Okay? and rejects the existence of God on the most superficial, superficial terms, okay? On the most ridiculous and superficial and irrational terms. And so Thomas is attempting here 
to explain the existence of God, how we know God exists by reason. Okay? By reason. And there are people who simply reject this. Most of the people who reject Thomas's arguments are those who don't understand them. Okay? They don't understand them because they confuse, they make the, they make the confusion between causes ordered per accident and causes ordered per se. They make that confusion. And they think that Thomas is talking about um, the domino god, the god who hits the first domino. And, and um, you know, I was, in fact, I was at Barnes & Noble and I was looking through a book by an atheist and that was his critique of Thomas's um, first motion, his, his argument for motion is that, you know, look, one, even if there is a God, once you start everything, you don't need God anymore. No, that's not how Thomas looks at the world. Thomas doesn't see the world as um, a painting created by God, and then God removes himself. Thomas sees the created order as a song being played by a violinist. Okay? If, if God is not there to sustain everything at any moment, at any particular moment, all right, then it goes out of existence. Remember, God is eternal. God doesn't exist in time. God only, for, and for God, every moment is now. Okay? Every moment is now. So God is not simply our creator. He is our sustainer. All right? So, you know, if... I talk about this in the, um, my talk on confession. The whole history of the Old Testament, if you will, is the history of the Jewish people turning to God and saying, Remember us, Lord. And God turning to Israel and saying, I will never forget you. Okay? I will never forget you. Because if God should forget us, it's not simply that we would no longer exist. It's as if we would no longer, we would never have existed in the first place because God is eternal. Okay? So that's the, that's the point that people miss with Aquinas. He's not talking about, you know, the watchmaker God who made the watch and then, you know, left it there. He's talking about the singer, the song, the one who creates the music by playing the music. And if he plays it constantly, eternally, and if he should ever stop playing the song, the song would not exist. And because it's God, the song would never have existed in the first place. Yes? Um, I guess I don't quite understand the per accidents and per se. You're saying that St. Thomas is per se. Yes. And not acknowledging that there is even a per accident. No, no, he acknowledges that there's per accidents. There certainly are things ordered per accidents. Like the dominoes example. That's a that's a perfect example. Or one of the examples he uses is the father, the grandfather, the father, and the son. Okay, the grandfather gives um, brings the son into life. Okay, but once the father, once okay, so you have three generations. Okay, grandfather, father, and son. Okay, so the grandfather produces the father. Okay, mm -hmm. but once the father, once the father is produced, the grandfather isn't needed anymore. Mm -hmm. The father continues to exist, and he can make his own son. Okay, mm -hmm. so again, this is this is per accident, and the the birth of the son, the conception of the son, isn't contingent on the conception of the grandfather, as long as the father is there, or the continued existence of the grandfather, as long as the father is there, the son can come into existence, right? Okay, so you're saying that... So there are certainly things that are ordered per accident. So you're saying that the, um, Jesus being born of the Virgin Mary is per accident. I mean... Because the father... Yeah, I mean, in that sense, I suppose, I hadn't thought about it that way because it's kind of an exception to the rule. 
Um, I have to give it a little thought, but I, 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 Well, that is what that is what demonstrates the existence of God. Is per se, not per accident. Yes, that is what demonstrates the existence of God. Per se, not per accident. Causes or order a series of causes ordered per per se is what demonstrates the existence of God. Now, you know, is is Thomas right? Is it fair of Thomas to say that the created order is a series of causes ordered per se? as opposed to per accident? I mean, I think, it's, I think it's fair because we see that there are series of causes ordered per se, okay? We certainly know of violinists and we know of, you know, pots of stew that are stirred. So there's plenty of examples in the created order of things that are ordered per se, causes that are ordered per se. So there's no reason that the universe couldn't be ordered per se. And it makes sense that it does and it makes sense that it is. Because if, if you think about it, okay, if the universe were infinite, all right, th there's just no way to get around it. If the, in if the universe were infinite, all right, then the universe is the cause of its own existence. All right? Well, why can't the universe be the cause of its own existence? Well, one of the reasons is because we see that, uh, and Thomas thought that it was actually possible that the universe, uh, Thomas didn't think that the universe was infinite, though he said he, he didn't think it could be proved in philosophically that it wasn't. Um, but if you think about it, if the we see that the universe is part of the created order, how do we know that? Because we see that the universe changes, okay? We see that the universe changes. And if the universe changes, yes, okay. If the universe changes, then this, there's an innumerable, and there's an infinite number of possible changes, okay? Then one of those infinite number of possible changes is non-existence. And if the universe is infinite, all right, given an infinite amount of time, if all, if all possible changes become actual changes, then there had to be a time when the universe didn't exist. Okay? So the bottom, and I, I, that sounds a little complicated. The bottom line is, if the universe exists, then we have to conclude that the universe is the cause of its own existence. Okay? And if the universe is the cause of its own existence, Okay, that's absurd because then the universe wouldn't change. The universe would be eternal. The universe would never have potentiality. And so the universe would never change. Because change means going from potentiality to actuality. Does that make sense? If the universe were the cause of its own existence, then the universe would be eternal. And if the universe were eternal, then the universe would not possess change. Okay? Because it would never have to, it, it would, it would depend on itself. But we see that the universe changes. So we see that the universe moves from potentiality to actuality. And by virtue of that, we know that the universe cannot be infinite, cannot be the cause of its own existence. Okay? I never thought that to begin with. <laughs> well, a lot of people do. I mean, God created everything. Yeah. So, you know. Well, but there are people who do. There are people who believe that the universe is the cause well, of its yeah, own I existence. I believe in the Big Bang Theory that this was just an automatic thing to happen because the planets were banging around into each other, and that's what sort of caused everything to happen. Well, that's not the Big Bang but, but there's this black hole out there <laughs> that nobody knows what's in the black hole. I don't know about that. <laughs> Isn't there a black hole out there, Bill? Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there, there are black holes that out there. Nobody knows what's in them. No. Eventually, they might. No, they never will, because if you get inside to a black, the definition of a black hole is a is a um, a vacuum that nothing, where energy cannot escape, nothing can escape from a black hole. So if you got yourself stuck into a black hole, um, you would never, you'd be there forever. I mean, there aren't any gases and things like that in a black hole. Yes, but they can't escape from the black hole. That's the point. Oh, how do they know that? <laughs> well, that I don't know. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of